Thank you, Joel. JC asked me to um, come speak to you just a little bit about uh, my career path and some of the things that um, I run into and learn. So hopefully this won't like totally put you to sleep, but it's hot in here, so <laughs> yeah, well. Um, so some of you know a little bit more about me than others, but um, I'm a fourth generation case stater. So and I grew up on a farm and I love the animals, so I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. And I had to come to K-State because that's where all pre-vet students in Kansas go. So I came to K-State and um, got a little out of hand my first semester and got a couple C's. And I thought, well, this isn't going to work for vet school. And I thought, you know, maybe I really don't want to be a veterinarian because I have to go to school for like eight or nine years. So I thought, well, what do I really love? And it came back to food. Um, I had always been like the person that wanted to stand on the stool and help make cookies or, you know, um, anything to do with food. Make the sandwiches to take out for harvest meals and things like that. So um, I started exploring options at K-State in food as an undergraduate um, in my second semester of my freshman year and um, found food science. And uh, it was also over in the College of Ag. Had some other friends in food science, so I thought, this is really cool. Um, you know, still a lot of science classes that I really like to take. And um, I like the meat science part of it, so I focused a lot on meat science and, and food science, food chemistry, food analysis, um, food micro, which were some pretty hard classes, but um, I found them really interesting. So dietetics is really kind of a second thing for me. Um, I graduated from K-State with a food science degree, and because I um, had been on the meat judging team and had so much fun on the meat judging team, learned so much, you know, we're driving around all over the U.S. in this big Dodge 12 passenger van. Just um, honestly, it sounds really kind of odd meat judging, but um, we had a lot of fun and we learned a lot about the cuts of meat, where they come from, and what's good quality meat and what's poor quality meat for all the different species. And so I wanted to focus my career on meat science. So um, at the time, I was working for Melvin Hunt over in food science. He's just recently retired. But um, he said there's an opening with Cargill down in Wichita at their product development center. And I thought, well, that would be pretty cool. So I interviewed for a position there as um, it was a pilot plant technician slash uh, food scientist. And they, um, they had they just created this position. No one, they, they were really only hiring masters and PhD students, but I just have my BS. But because I had been involved in the meat judging team as an undergraduate, I had worked for Dr. Hunt and helped him with a lot of research papers, um, they felt like I was qualified. So I guess lesson number one as an undergraduate, get involved, which clearly all of you are if you're here. Um, but take those extra opportunities that you have that almost sound bizarre. Like when my friend suggested, um, well, I was in a sorority, and a gal that was in the clutch class above me, she said she was on the meat judging team, and she said, oh, you should do that. You'd like it. Meat judging, what in the world is that? You're running around with a hard hat and a frock on. But I thought, eh, well, whatever, I'll try it. So um, take those chances that you think this is kind of bizarre, but, you know, maybe I'm interested, and they, they end up paying off. So I guess lesson number one, would be just to get super involved right now while you have time because once you graduate and you have a family and stuff like that you don't have time you have no time <laughs> um, so i started working for cargill down at um, in wichita at the time it was xl xl was the red meats division and i worked in pork products and we um, i was the person in their r d center that would go into the pilot plant, which is the small scale equipment of what was in our big plants, and the sales staff would come in and they'd say, okay, we have um, a client, let's see, one was Denny's. We have Denny's, and Denny's wants us to make them a breakfast pork chop. And this is a four ounce pork chop, and they want to be able to cook it on a clamshell in less than two minutes, yada yada. So I would go into the plant working with another food scientist who would do the formulations, and I would make these products. And then we would ship them out to wherever the salesman wanted them to go, and the customer would test them and all that stuff. Um, I really loved that job, honestly. It was um, it was just a little bit of everything, which is kind of what I like to do. 
Um, we did shelf life testing where we would cut um, pork chops up and we put them under different environments to mimic grocery stores to see how long they would last. We'd use different injections in them to see if we could reduce the microbe load. So we did a lot of cool projects. And one thing I really liked about working there was when customers would come in, I would get to host them and take them through the plant, talk about our products, and um, just do a lot of fun things with the sales staff and customers. Um, some of the lesser fun things or things I didn't enjoy as much was all the travel. Um, when you work for a corporation, you work your tail off. It's um, your slave to the company, and that's good and bad. You get a lot of good opportunities, but you also, um, you really have to be both feet in. And so we would go out to plants, um, and when I say plants, I mean like places where they kill hogs and they process them into the different primal cuts. So we would go out to the plants and run different tests. Um, some of the tests might have to do with other parts of Cargill where they would feed the hog a certain ration and they would bring us in as meat scientists and we would look at the hog through the slaughter process and the chilling process and then see like what the marbling was in it or the fat layer, different things like that. So I would help coordinate those tests at the plant and you know when you go to a plant you're in um, full gum boots and long frocks, your hair is back in a massive hairnet, hard hat on, earplugs in, I mean you feel like you're going into battle almost. And, it's a pretty wet environment, cold environment. And, you know, I thought, I don't want to do this kind of stuff forever. I think I'm really more interested in food instead of all this manufacturing stuff. So I worked for Cargill for about two and a half years. And I told my boss at the time, who was a good friend, I said, you know, I just, I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life. I'm more interested in nutrition and food. And um, so he said, well, okay, <laughs> you know, I hate to lose you, but if that's what you want to do, you need to, to go after it, do it. And um, it was, it's, he was my mentor. He still is my mentor. In fact, he, his name is Scott Eiler. He's a VP of, um, gosh, what part of Cargill is he in now? He just moved out of R&D, but he's vice president of, like, for food safety or something at Cargill. And so um, I still stay in touch with him. So I guess that would be a second piece of advice for you is find a mentor. Um, it might be in your first job, it might be someone right now that you know, but um, Scott was really there for me like every step of the way. I would go in and talk to him, he would give me advice, and um, as long as I worked hard for him, he was always willing to go to back for me. Um, even when I applied to my PhD program here, he's, you know, his, when I called and asked him for reference, all he said was, you know, it's about time, Schrader, you need to get that done. And so, um, Find someone that you feel you connect with, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to find that person that you really connect with. Um, but once you find them, take advantage of their network, take advantage of all the things that they know, and let them help you throughout the rest of your life, honestly, because you get back to them too. In fact, Scott has two daughters, and I, when I worked at Cargill, they were like this, and now they're like this. Um, one of his daughters is a freshman here at K-State. The other daughter is a diabetic, and she's um, insulin dependent. And so when she got diagnosed, he called me and he said, you know, Grace is, um, is insulin dependent diabetic, and we've got this going on now. And uh, about a year ago, he said, you know, Grace is really thinking about going into dietetics at K-State. Can you, can you talk to her and tell her what it's all about? So we've actually managed to help each other out through the entire process. It's kind of funny how it turns around, or comes around. So never burn bridges. Find a mentor, never burn bridges. Um, you know, you, some days you want to. Some days I didn't like Scott very much. He, he got under my skin sometimes, but you know, I always appreciated the things that he told me. He was always honest with me, and I appreciated that. Um, so I decided to, to quit with Cargill, although sometimes I wish I kind of would have stuck it out, but I've realized that I'm in the right place. I'm really happy with what I do now. Um, and, you know, thinking about it, Cargill's a big company. I love the company. There's always opportunities with them as a dietitian, too, which I've definitely thought about. But I came back to school, and another one of my food scientist friends at Cargill, um, he said he, he, had, he was a PhD. His wife was working on two PhDs. They were a really smart couple. But he said, if you go back to K-State, you better get your MS, because you don't want to just have an RD. You want to have an MS, too, as long as you're going back. So I thought, well, OK. 
okay, I guess that'll add two more semesters, but I guess I'll get my MS too. So um, as I came back, I worked on all the classes I needed for my RB. At the same time, I worked on the MS classes, and in hindsight, that was a really good decision too, because I couldn't be an instructor without having my MS, which is ultimately what I wanted to do, I just didn't quite realize that's, that's where I wanted to be. So I worked on those at the same time, um, and it, it was a good chance. Always take chances when you have, I mean, there's usually something that tells you, I need to, to take advantage of this because I'm here. Kind of like with Amber and I are on our PhD programs, we're here at K-State. We have all this wealth of knowledge around us. We need to take advantage of it and pick up every bit of education we can while we're here. Because who's to say we're not going to, you know, leave next semester or something? You just never know. So take advantage of the opportunities that are, are around you that, that you can possibly take advantage of. Um, but I uh, worked on my RD, and at the same time I was working on that RD and MS, I started working for Housing and Dining over in their bakery, in the retail bakery, uh, managing it. I worked there as an undergraduate, always kind of gravitated to baking. I mean, it always came back to food for me. Um, and that's when I realized I was probably in the right place. I, I liked dietetics because it was a mixture of food, it was a mixture of science, it was a mixture of nutrition, and um, anatomy and physiology, which I loved, uh, loved human body. I've never worked so hard in my life as that semester of human body, but I loved every second of it. So um, bringing all that together with dietetics was like, I, you get this feeling, oh, I'm finally here, I'm finally home, I know where I want to be, what I want to do when I grow up. And um, so I finished my MS, and there was an opening at Kramer about the time I was finishing. Um, another dietitian was leaving, and I, they said, you know, do you, do you want to work for us? And at the time, I was living about 30 miles south of here, um, was married then, and no kiddo yet, but I thought, you know, instead of me thinking that I need to be a clinical dietitian, because that's what I really wanted to do after I got my dietetics degree, I thought, well, you know, you like food, you like working for housing and dining, maybe you should just do that. It's a shorter commute than Topeka which is where I was working at Stormont Vale. And um, so I took a chance with um, the position open at Kramer and realized that you know I love working with students. I still got to be around food um, and, and kind of help create food every day. And the other thing I realized about myself is that I like the hospitality part of it, like helping people, giving them food, helping them eat healthier really helps you feel like you're taking care of someone. And I think that's something that drives me is to help take care of um, our customers. And honestly, like even in class with you guys, I like, I like it at the end of the semester because it, you get to see this huge jump and how much you've grown and you don't, you guys probably don't realize it, but we see it as instructors and it's really very cool. Um, so I've been at Housing and Dining for, gosh, going on 12 years now. And that role kind of changed. Um, when I was pregnant with Anna, I was, it was a summer over at Derby, it was a very hot summer over at Derby, but um, the instructor that was in 342 decided he didn't want to do it anymore. He just pretty much said, well, I, I'm not interested in doing it. And at some point I had mentioned to Mr. Pence that eventually I would really like to teach a class. Eventually. I'm thinking like when I'm 40 or 50, I kind of want to teach a class. I was 28 at the time, I think. And so, Pence came to me and he said, well, Mr. E doesn't want to teach this class anymore, you want to teach it? I said, like, what? I said, I am not prepared. I'm like, I am not prepared to teach a class. I thought I would do that like in 10 or 15 years. And he just looked at me and said, well, why not? Why not you? And so I thought to myself, well, why not me? I, I can do this. So I guess the other thing I want to tell you is why not you? Like there's no reason that you can't do things that maybe you think are a little far out there, but who better than you to do it? So I took a chance with that, um, you know, newborn teaching class the first semester. It was terrible. Um, Jennifer Kennedy, who I work with at Kramer now, she was in that first class, and she's like, well, it's not as bad as you remember it. I'm like, I'm sure it was terrible. But um, survived, and I feel like over the years I've gotten a lot better, a lot more comfortable with teaching class and with um, whole concept of, of teaching management and food um, to, you know, some people that are interested, some people that aren't interested. We always try to make it 
interesting um, because you never know where you're going to end up. I never thought I would be back at K-State. Um, never thought I'd be working on campus and getting my PhD ever. It's, but, you know, it's just how life happens. So, um, like I said, I've been really fortunate to work for Housing and Dining. They've treated me very well in the fact that anytime I've asked to um, go to continuing education, a conference, or maybe run for a national office or state office, they've said, mainly Mr. Pence and Dr. Moult, because that's who my uh, bosses are, they said, why not? Do it. Go. Do it. And so sometimes you kind of have to take that leap of faith. Like my first um, elected position for our, our NACUFs was um, at a, a regional, never been to a regional conference before. No one else from K-State wanted to go. And so I thought, well, okay, I'm going to run for this office I know nothing about. I'm going to go to this conference I know absolutely no one at, and it'll be okay. And you know what? It was. I ran out of pose, luckily. So I won. Um, apparently no one wanted to be an information officer because it's a lot of work. I didn't realize that when I was running for it. But um, it wasn't that bad. But it was, um, it was one of those times when you take a chance and you grow a lot because you're doing something, again, that you never really thought you'd do, that I didn't think I was qualified for. But the food service director over at KU, she nominated me. And so once she nominated me, I thought, well, gosh, if Nana thinks I can do it, I can surely do it. It can't be that bad. And it wasn't. I met so many colleagues through NACUFs. Um, and luckily, we had the, the good opportunity to be on um, our National Conference Planning Committee for 2015. Um, I stuck with the information officer for two terms because it was so much fun to meet people and be on council. Um, have managed to go to all different conferences all over the U.S. and one was in Hawaii. I guess that was American Dietetic Association conference. But um, so take all the continuing education opportunities that you can. If someone offers you something like that, jump on it. Don't think about, well, do I have time or do I don't have time? I mean, sometimes the money's a factor and you do have to consider that. Um, hopefully your employer sees it, sees it as an investment in you and a further investment in them, which is how Mr. Pence saw it all. But, um, you know, he, he basically said, well, no one wants to go. Do you want to go? And I thought, well, I guess I'll go. I don't know anything about what we're going to, but why not me? So take that approach, if you will, with with opportunities that come your way. Say to yourself, why not me? I'm just as qualified as the next person, even though in your mind you might think there's no way I'm qualified to do this. No one knows that. I mean, they wouldn't ask you if they didn't see some bit of qualification in you, is what I've kind of come to realize. Um, so I'm here going on 13 years, and um, I think it's been a good opportunity. I like. I really like the job I have now because I get to do so many different things. Um, and the best part of it, honestly, is teaching class. Like, I've never come out of a lecture at 3.30 in the afternoon in a bad mood. And I've went in a bad mood plenty of times. But just getting to interact um, with all of you who have really, you have really great ideas, you have fresh ideas. Um, it, it, makes, it makes when you get in a rut feel good because you kind of get out of that rut for at least an hour or so. Um, so, still working with food, love food, love the idea of us building a new dining center, although that's getting pretty stressful right now. As, as Joel knows, we were gone last week for like two days, and Joel, JC, and Sam, and who else, someone else, Jen, and who else ran the ship? <coughs> There's four of you. Kaylee? Kaylee, yeah. Kayla, yeah. got all these random pictures of these guys. <laughs> passed out from exhaustion and stuff. Um, again, just another good opportunity to, to go do different stuff. So anyway, it's really not a very exciting story, but um, it's, looking back, it's over, what, 20, 18, 20 years. It's, um, it's not where I thought I'd be, but I'm glad I'm here. I wouldn't be anywhere else. I can't see myself anywhere else now. I mean, I can see myself moving on to something different, but um, good to me so yeah do you have any questions <laughs> I guess yeah. yeah okay so I know you work with um, the food allergies and stuff and planning like what they can eat and stuff so I was talking to a girl that has celiac disease okay. how many students roughly do you have to do that for like, you know, 
meal planning? Well, I know she says you give her like a menu mm -hmm. and every week and then you say what she can sure. or can't eat or whatever. Right, part of my job at Kramer is to um, do special projects. Part of it's also to work with the food allergy students. Um, Mrs. Kobasa and I are the two registered dietitians there. And so um, it kind of falls on both of us to do that. And honestly, I really like to do it. She's busy with management of personnel and things like that. So um, what we do for our food allergy students, and specifically, well, we can only do it for the students that come in and talk to us. If they don't come in and state they have an allergy and advocate for themselves, there's no way that we can help them. So in a lot of cases, depending on the severity of the allergy, I will take our menus and using Computrition, um, using, I go up with my iPad, snap pictures of all the box labels and the ingredient statements in them. I'll go through the menu and um, customize it to their allergy, marking out the items that they can't have. Um, right now I'm just doing the gluten freeze because those are the only allergy patient or allergy students that are currently requesting it. But like in the fall semester, we had one gal that came in with a medical documentation of like 22 allergies. And I mean, it, it's really, I try to put myself in the position that if that were Anna, how would I want her to be treated? And so it's easy to go the extra mile when you kind of look at it like that. And um, so I go through the menu and mark off all the things that she couldn't have. And, um, she chose to uh, to uh, I think study abroad this semester or something. So I'm down to only marking the gluten-free menus. But yeah, we really try to um, to put the student first as best we can. I mean, you know, quantity food production. It's um, sometimes like hitting a moving target. But um, as much as we can, we try to customize it to meet their needs. Now, with the new dining center, what we're planning is something um, to help them be more integrated into um, just the, the daily food choices. Um, we don't have that luxury right now at Kramer because we're, we're so compact. Um, but we have some different plans in place for the new facility where they'll be able to queue up kind of with their friends and get their allergen-free meal and not kind of be segregated out like they are now. Although we will still have a specific segregated spot that those people with really severe allergies that are really petrified of eating anything, we can have their special food for them in there and, and they can um, still have access to it. But we're really trying to, to get everyone, um, or get the food allergy students to feel like they're part of the social aspect of dining. Yeah. It takes a lot of work marking the menus, but you do kind of get into rhythm knowing the products, knowing the labels. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate it.